My name is David Whitwer, and I am the president of the Pennsylvania Historical Association. I want to welcome all of you who are watching this to one of the series of webinars that our association is making as part of a new effort uh, to use the power of Zoom, which faculty members have become kind of painfully uh, aware of during the recent pandemic, to use that power of Zoom to reach out to the public about the activities of our organization using slightly a different way, to sort of publicize what we're doing in other venues through this particular venue. So today's webinar will focus on a special summer issue of our association's journal, which is entitled Pennsylvania History. I got a cool background, but I think you can see it. There you go. Um, uh, this issue was entitled Rethinking 18th Century Pennsylvania's Borderlands. Uh, it was quite a fascinating issue uh, with, with really wonderful articles. And we're gonna be hearing today from the journal's longtime editor, Linda Rees, as well as the guest editor, Timothy Shannon, and two of the contributors to the journal, uh, both Paul Newman and Jonathan Burns. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the people who really played the frontline role in making all this happen. Uh, and we will start uh, with, uh, the among the other participants, we will start with Linda Reese, who will take it away. Hi. Um, as David said, I've been editor of Pennsylvania History, a journal of mid-Atlantic studies since 2014. Um, we try to do a special theme issue at least once a year, of which this issue is the latest. Last year, we actually did a double issue on uh, commemorating uh, women and uh, gender rights in honor of the 19th Amendment. And um, I will add that uh, next year, summer 2022, we're gonna do a special issue on disability rights in Pennsylvania history, edited by Dr. Dennis Downey, retired of Millersville University. Um, and if anyone has an idea for a future special issue or an article, I'd certainly like to hear about it. So uh, this, our, uh, this uh, issue grew out of a, a um, session that we had uh, in the PHA annual meeting in Lancaster in 2018, and it was called What's New on the Old Pennsylvania Frontier. And it was a way to examine uh, the new research that's being done, uh, blending archaeology with history um, and that sort of thing. So during the, uh, while the meeting was progressing, we thought, uh, Carla Mulford actually suggested we contact Dr. Timothy Shannon because he is well qualified to talk about the frontier in Pennsylvania history. And I will introduce him now. We're pleased to have him as guest editor. Professor Shannon teaches early American, Native American and British history at Gettysburg College. And his later, his most recent book is Indian Captive Indian King, Peter Williamson in America and Britain. So uh, without further ado, um, Dr. Shannon, please take it away. Thank you very much, Linda. And uh, hello to everyone uh, on this, in, in this Zoom conference and hello to all of you uh, who might be uh, watching this and learning a bit more about this special issue. Uh, I, I wanna thank Linda for thinking of me in, in the role as a guest editor for this. I was at the uh, PHA meeting in Lancaster uh, that, that, that she just referenced. And as I recall, there was you know, the session that she specifically referred to, but there were several other sessions uh, that talked about uh, 18th century uh, Pennsylvania history that uh, I think you know, is an indication of the degree of interest among current scholars about uh, what we would call uh, the, the, the Pennsylvania frontier. And so that is, is, is part of the, the inspiration of this special issue. Um, in, in my introduction, I tried to take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the historiography of the Pennsylvania frontier. In particular, you know, starting with this, this question of what's the difference between a frontier and a borderland? Uh, if you're conversant in early American history these days, you know the term borderland or borderlands, sometimes it's uh, rendered in the plural, has become increasingly popular, uh, certainly within the last 20 or 30 years. And it's used to describe all sorts of regions uh, across North America, in some cases um, elsewhere in the Americas, 
in which native peoples and colonial peoples collided uh, and oftentimes um, uh, imperial powers uh, got involved in the mix as well. And of course, if you've studied Pennsylvania history, you know, that sounds like the, the textbook story of, of, of the meeting of, of, of colonial peoples and native peoples uh, in, um, in, in, in Penn's woods uh, starting in, in the 17th century and continuing through the era of the American Revolution. Uh, and many great historians in the past you know, have written about this. Certainly when I was um, in graduate school, the, 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 the significant figure here was Francis Jennings. Uh, and um, since then, certainly uh, Jim Merrill's book, Into the American Woods, which is now 20 years old, you know, was a, a, a very significant work of historical scholarship that dealt specifically with uh, the Pennsylvania frontier. And, and the distinction that I, that I drew in, in, in my introduction was that, um, you know, borderlands emphasize uh, the, uh, the, the meetings of people, if not on, on equal ground, at least uh, neither side has the ability to control affairs. And so that um, really it's, its emphasis is on the, the quality of negotiation that goes on between natives and newcomers in places where nobody really holds the upper hand in terms of military power or, or political power. And that um, even though um, many of the books that I cite is, is recent studies of, um, of colonial Pennsylvania still use the word frontier in their title to describe their topic, they're really doing borderlands history. And I think if we're aware of this, it helps us, I think, uh, orient Pennsylvania's history the Mid-Atlantic uh, region's history into the wider historiographic context of what's going on now when we study early American history, especially this, this continental focus that it has recently acquired. And so we have in the issue um, four articles. Uh, uh, two of our authors are not here uh, today, and so I, I just want to mention their articles. Scott Paul Gordon, uh, Fishing for a Few Moravians on the 18th Century, Pennsylvania Frontier is an excellent study of the Moravians' efforts to proselytize, not just among Native Americans, but among other colonial peoples on the 18th century Pennsylvania frontier. And Christopher Ryan Pearl's Becoming Patriots, the struggle for inclusion and exclusion on Pennsylvania's revolutionary frontier is about a community of Scots-Irish squatters on the Western branch of the Susquehanna River uh, during the Revolutionary Era, uh, another really great article. And then there is a comment on all four articles by Patrick Spiro, who's written extensively about the meaning of frontier in colonial Pennsylvania. So I do recommend uh, that everybody take the opportunity to read all of these articles. Um, but now I, I do want to address the two articles that were written by our other two guests here today. Uh, Paul Douglas Newman is a professor of early American history at Pitt Johnstown. And his article is titled The Four Nations of Indians Upon the Susquehanna, Mid-Atlantic Murder, Diplomacy, and Political Identity, 1717 to 1723. And Jonathan Burns is the director of the Cultural Resource Institute at Juniata College. And his article is titled The Fort Shirley Site, A Nexus of Archaeology and History on the Pennsylvania Colonial Frontier. Uh, Paul, I, I would like to start off with you. Uh, and ask you uh, if you could just give us a general um, uh, overview of your piece. And if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about how it fits into your, your broader research and writing these days. Thank you, Tim, uh, very much. And thank you for writing that wonderful introduction to our, our volume. Um, well, uh, this piece began uh, for me a long, long time ago now, back in the uh, 2000 aughts after a conversation with a uh, friend and mentor, now departed, Bill Pensack of uh, Penn State University. Um, I was a beginning a career, actually the, the, this begins in the 1990s, I was beginning a career at Pitt Johnstown teaching undergraduates uh, how to write their senior research seminars. And, and Bill had just arrived at Penn State and was teaching a research uh, class. And I asked him what he was doing. And he said, well, I'm writing a paper along with them uh, for them to model my behavior. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. And so I, I began doing that. And so this particular project began about 13, 14 years ago with a, uh, a class of seniors. And we all picked a topic and I gave them things to some primary sources within um, the printed Pennsylvania Archives series um, to use, including myself. I gave myself an assignment. 
I was looking in the 17 teens and 20s and came across the murder of Sawantane, um, was uh, absolutely fascinated by the, the diplomatic machinations that were going on between Indians and colonists and the empires. Um, and it kind of began that way. So um, it's been percolating for quite some time. And so every four semesters, I teach the, the senior writing seminar. And so I would pick it back up and pick it back up. And so now I'm I don't know, I guess five or six projects in. I've published this piece with Pennsylvania History. I published a piece two years ago with Journalism History about uh, Ben Franklin and the uh, Pennsylvania Gazette and the, the beginning of the French and Indian War in Pennsylvania, um, but also dealing with um, uh, Lenape Indian warriors and, and their war of independence. So in all of these pieces, um, in which this is a, a now part of a larger work that uh, I need to sit down and, and really put into monograph form. Um, I've been uh, dealing with um, Native peoples in Pennsylvania who are a collection of refugees coming from north, south, and uh, west into Pennsylvania in the uh, late 17th through the early mid 18th century, um, who began to coalesce together uh, into um, towns uh, that were multinational, multi-ethnic, multilingual, um, crossing uh, not just language barriers, but whole language families uh, between Iroquois and Algonquin, um, and even within Algonquin between Shawnees and Lenape who couldn't understand one another, their, their languages were that far apart, and yet who very, very quickly, um, and David, who is a scholar of labor history, would be quick to recognize this, that very, very quickly overcame those linguistic barriers and joined together as a labor union would um, in order to face a greater exterior threat. Uh, and that threat, of course, in a place like Pennsylvania began with traders bringing illicit rum, settlers bringing uh, animals and their own uh, surveying equipment and setting up on land on Indian hunting and, and farming land. And then of course, the, the empires themselves who were, were gunning for that land. And so in Pennsylvania, I begin to see um, really very early, um, you know, after Penn's arrival in the 1680s and 1690s, are these nascent efforts um, beginning with the, the Lenape uh, in the Delaware Valley and the uh, erstwhile Susquehannocks, our Conestogas, Gandestogas, uh, Mingos uh, in the lower Susquehanna Valley, uh, who begin to find ways to politically ingratiate themselves and then to use diplomacy uh, with uh, colonies, whether it's Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, New York, sometimes all four, sometimes two at a time. Um, and then through those colonies, empires, Great Britain, uh, France, the Dutch, um, in order to find a way um, to play all of those entities uh, off one another for the purpose of establishing nations uh, and nationhood and national sovereignty uh, and sovereignty over land, farmland, and, and trading rights, um, and for the right as nations to deal with these independent colonies and these independent empires. Um, and it becomes more and more and more sophisticated as the 18th century um, rolls along um, to the point where uh, in the 1750s, uh, they, uh, within about a, a year of the publication of the Law of Nations, are invoking the laws of nations uh, and, and are arguing that they uh, should have the same rights as other nations upon the earth, um, to the point where we get to the 1770s uh, that the Delaware Indians are, are trying to raise money to send delegations to Great Britain in 1775 to, to try to become a colony of their own right. And then they sent a delegation to uh, Philadelphia in 1776 to, to make a play to become a state and become an ally and part of the United States. Um, of course, these things fail, um, but they are um, incredibly um, sophisticated and brave um, solutions that they find and actions that they take uh, to try to survive the onslaught of settlement in the 18th century. Um, and, and failure doesn't matter. <laughs> in a lot of, I always tell students that the F word does not matter. Um, what matters is, is, is how people um, face these kinds of threats and how they, they remain with them. Um, and so these multinational kind of, of, of responses 
become pan-Indian responses by the end of the 18th, early 19th century. And then in the 20th century become multinational responses again, in response to the termination efforts of the 1950s through 1970s, uh, where you see the nationalities that have been pushed sometimes like the Shawnee and, and Delaware onto common reservation lands in places like Oklahoma, where they work together politically and diplomatically still trying to assert sovereignty. Um, and now here into the 21st century, it's still going on. Um, so that's my larger work and, and where it fits. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Paul, very much. Um, I, I want to switch gears now over to Jonathan. And then uh, after we hear from Jonathan, we can come back and perhaps address some of those uh, points that you raised. Uh, Jonathan, tell us about uh, your work. Of course, you're, you're an archaeologist. Uh, and here you are. Uh, sticking your head into a history journal uh, uh, to tell us a, a little bit about the, the larger project that this uh, work came out of. And uh, I know you're, you've continued to work on it this summer as well, right? Sure. Thank you, Tim. And Paul, by the way, your, your article is, is fascinating and I have questions for you for sure. Um, you know, as, as an archaeologist wading into uh, doing historic archaeology after being trained as a prehistoric archaeologist, um, on complicated sites from hunter-gatherers and, and early farmers using rock shelters. Um, the opportunity came to me in 2009 to start studying the Fort Shirley site, uh, which is in the county I live in, Huntington County here, um, in uh, South Central PA. And uh, I was an archaeologist looking to, uh, to teach field schools and also practical methodologies to students. And uh, we sort of cobbled together the idea that I um, do a field school through Penn State at the Fort Shirley site, knowing that there was some good indication that, that it hasn't been, hadn't been disturbed and it might be archeologically viable. Um, and I started you know, kind of falling into doing field schools then for the next six, uh, well, five years through Penn State and then working through Juniata College, um, still doing sites right here in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, primarily uh, on French and Indian War conflict sites or, and fortifications. So this was the one that kicked off my, um, my career in finding forts and, and being the guy that gets contacted when, um, when the cultural resources implications come into play, um, like not knowing where a fort is, for example, it's in danger of, uh, of being um, taken out by development. Or, or other activities. So I'm, as an archeologist, I'm very much into advocating for and studying uh, archeological sites and preserving them. And uh, that can't always be done. So I teach methodologies that collect information on them as we as archeologists do controlled destruction of these sites uh, in many cases ahead of, of um, construction projects. Um, but I've, I've been in this nice zone where I can teach the practical applications of of archaeology from my backyard, so I can do a lot of field work, um, and and I happen to be in the right spot to uh, to do French and Indian War archaeology. Um, so uh, as I as I began working at um, the Fort Shirley site, we utilized a, a historic document, a map drawn by surveyor John Armstrong, you know, the hero of Catanning, comes back to to the Fort Shirley site in seventeen. 61 to, uh, to draw a survey map, to survey the plots because he had land there and, and so did George Crowen who was trying to recoup his losses. Um, so uh, what I fell into was a very interesting archeological record. Uh, it's actually very unique what we find at Fort Shirley versus um, contemporary fortifications from in Pennsylvania, um, mainly because it was so multi-ethnic uh, in, in its occupation respect to um, George Crowen and his, uh, his indentured servants and his, his slaves, who we have uh, historical documentation for, um, but also a very important group of refugees, um, the Mingo Seneca, who were displaced uh, from the forks of the Ohio when the French uh, decided to occupy it. Um, and uh, George Crowen seemed to be the one that these refugees trusted the most. Um, and uh, what developed out of his being the de facto Indian agent for, for provincial Pennsylvania 
um, was he was hosting this, another site grew uh, around his plantation site at Alwick, Alwick Creek, which was just a trading path and a way to get up to the Juniata and then through, um, you know, through to Western lands. He knew this trading post well. So when his trading operations were interrupted in, uh, by the French in 1753, he had to fall back uh, to somewhere safe and that he knew. And he already had an operation at Alwick. So this was a, this was a good place for him to sort of um, figure out how things were gonna play out as, as conflict began to erupt on the frontier. Um, so the Mingo Seneca refugees settled on the field below him. And what's fascinating to me as an archeologist is that there's so much written record to go along with um, the accounts of not only the relationships between the Native Americans there and George Crowen, um, but also the fact that Alwick, because of his presence and because the Mingo Seneca were there, this place became um, sort of a, a place for um, folks to come counsel as Native American groups from the Ohio country were deciding whether to side with the, the French or the English. So it was sort of a, uh, an outpost of diplomacy. Um, and uh, what was really interesting to me was the glass trade beads and the copper ornaments uh, that Native Americans uh, would have been wearing and would have been dropping on the site. And having, uh, we were very lucky in that we found the palisade of the fort. Oftentimes you can find the right artifacts, but if you don't know where the palisade or the edges or the walls are. Um, it's difficult to convince people that you have in, fa in fact found the fort. And then uh, once you know that you can kind of talk about site structure, like where am I in the fort and how did this fort in particular grow? Um, and we were finding artifacts that the natives had obviously dropped well within the, the fortification boundaries and especially deep within the, um, the Palisade Trench, you know, the long, deep, narrow trench that uh, vertical logs would have been erected into to, to create the, the defensive position. And as we excavated the, the feature and kind of worked our way around the perimeter of the fort, um, there was never a time where we weren't recovering Native American, either glass beads or um, these copper trinkets or evidence of production of these copper trinkets um, all throughout the site. So what that indicated to me was, here's, here's a group of Native Americans who are, are throwing in their labor to assist George Crow and, and his group, you know, basically to, to, uh, to protect his trading post as, um, as, as raiding parties were beginning to, to enter Pennsylvania from the West, French and Indian allies. Um, so it, it became a place of intelligence gathering um, and was just a, a, a nexus of, of multicultural occupation. And being able to see that in the written record and the archeological record uh, is extremely interesting to me. Um, the, the one item that got the most, uh, that's, that's the most famous from this site is, is a very small uh, copper charm, um, the size of my pinky nail that we pictured in the article. Uh, it's, it's Arabic script and stamped onto a very small, um, token, which would have been worn uh, to, to basically uh, connect someone to their religion, which was, was the Muslim religion. It's Arabic script, it's stylized, it says, no God but Allah. And it has a tiny chain that, that wouldn't be been a gaudy um, display of, of religion. But uh, if we had found a crucifix, you know, we would have been assuming that there had been a devout Catholic on site. Uh, where in this case, this puzzled us to the point where I, I think what we have is a piece of a rare piece of material culture from the from the slave trade, from the early slave trade. Um, I have a colleague at Juniata College, Ryan Mather, who does uh, isotope work, and we actually nicked a little piece of the broken chain off, and he was able to source the copper um, to Cornwall, England, and that sort of helped us. Um, you know, with archaeology, you never know, with 250 years passing, how items can come to rest and to make sure we could associate it with the occupation, we wanted to be very careful. Um, I contacted Sylviane Diouf, who's the foremost scholar in um, Muslims in colonial America, and she, um, we chatted and she looked at the item and said she'd never seen anything like it. Um, 
so that again it made me realize that it's rare but the fact that it was stamped makes me think that there that there are more out there um so uh, luckily it's it's on display currently at the museum of the american revolution in their um display on religion on the frontier and i'm hoping that with all the you know millions of eyes that go past the the display that sometime um someone is going to to give us a little bit more information about a sister piece to this item uh, but until this point it's it seems like it's it's just a very rare um piece of material culture linking back to uh, what we already suspected from the written record thank you jonathan uh very much yes that uh the amulet that you're describing was was featured in the session at the PHA and it, and it definitely got the most reaction uh, from the audience that you've had that day. Uh, what I think both of your um, articles do in, in, a, in an excellent way is, is remind us that, uh, you know, the back country of Pennsylvania was a, a crossroads of the world in, in, in many respects, certainly in terms of the different ethnicities of, uh, of colonists that were meeting out there, Scots, Irish, Germans, English, and, and so forth. Uh, Paul, you remind us that this was obviously native territory, but contested native territory. Many different uh, Indian groups that um, were, were living in this region, others that were claiming uh, sovereignty over it. Uh, and, you know, is, 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 uh, I, I like that image you give us of, you know, if, if we look at Oklahoma today and we look at how uh, the history of the United States has led to these uh, various native groups uh, having to amalgamate you know, in these in these uh, partnerships on this uh, reservation land uh, in, in Oklahoma, uh, that's pretty much exactly what's going on in the Lower Susquehanna Valley uh, in the in the late 19th and, and early 18th centuries. Um, you know, both of you uh, remind me that uh, when we look at it, it reminds me of, of of what chemists do. You know, with with, with a with a microscope, when you, when you look at something on the slide with, with just your, your, your plain eyes, it looks like a solid, you know, and it, and it looks like the, the borders are very well defined. Uh, but when you put it under the microscope, things break up uh, and, you, and you see uh, a lot of the component parts uh, that, that, that are making up whatever that, that is a sample of. And that's exactly what uh, your articles uh, do for us uh, in this particular issue of Pennsylvania history. Um, Linda, I'll give you uh, the last word if you'd like. Uh, just a couple of observations. I'm sitting here thinking of your introductory essay um, about frontier versus borderland, the word. And just to muddy the waters a little, uh, I looked up the origin of the word frontier is actually French, but means borderland. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, um, and I'm also thinking of Star Trek, the final frontier space. That implies that there's no end to it. And it, Star Trek would not sound the same if it was space, the final border. <laughs> so, you know, border implies there's a line there somewhere, but frontier implies there's no line. Um, and I also, one of the, th I'm a former archeologist turned archivist and historian um, but I'm a great believer in the interdisciplinary approach to history, which is why material culture, and I think we've seen in this case, uh, really changes things uh, in terms of interpretation of the Pennsylvania frontier. This proves that it was far more diverse than we really thought about. Uh, when I was coming up in history and reading about the um, the Pennsylvania, the colonial Pennsylvania frontier, it was always white guys this, white guys that. Indians were sometimes mentioned, but now we have lots of information, perhaps never enough on the Native Americans, we need to keep pursuing that, but also information on, gee, they had slaves, and, um, and perhaps some of them were Muslim, uh, and, it just blows the whole thing wide open, if you ask me. So I am so pleased that we were able to accomplish this issue. I think it is excellent. It's a feather in PA history's cap. And I can, I can only thank and thank the participants uh, once again. Okay. Um, 
I want to say thank you to all the participants in this webinar. Uh, you guys timed it out perfectly, almost as if you'd uh, rehearsed it uh, a million times. Uh, but we're at 30 minutes, and I think uh, I think in a sense it's it's a it's a nice sort of complete unit right now as a way to sort of showcase uh, both the, the the journal special issue, but also those two particular pieces. And so I'm going to thank you all for your participation. And uh, I will urge those who are uh, who, those who are uh, watching this webinar to uh, to uh, take a look at the at the special issue, and I, I think you'll find it very rewarding. And uh, with that, I'm going to say uh, uh, goodbye, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Bye bye. Bye.